All right, good morning, friends. I am grateful to be with you. I'm excited to be with you this morning. I hope you are as well. I want to invite you to grab a Bible, grab your Bible, whether it's on your device, or maybe you don't have a Bible. We have one underneath the seat for you to, to open up. And I want to invite you to turn with me to 2 Timothy. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, the Bible that's underneath the seat that you're sitting on is page 1192. And I want to start here first before we go to Hebrews chapter 12. We've been in this series called This Keeps You Running. And as I've been thinking about that, I've been thinking this, and that is every race comes to an end. Every race comes to an end, athletically speaking and even spiritually speaking, every race ends. And before we look at Hebrews chapter 12, I want us to look at two runners. And I want you to get a picture as we walk through together this morning. And so let's look at this first runner. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have, what does your scripture say? I have, talk to me, I have finished, thank you. I have finished the course. Maybe your Bible says, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Over the last four weeks, as as we've been in this series, this has been our aim for you, that you would finish the course, that you would finish the race. This is what we've been aiming for. This has been our hope, our dream, that like the Apostle Paul who wrote 2 Timothy, you would be able to declare, I have finished the race. But there's another runner. There's another runner I want you to see as we look at verse 9. Make every effort to come to me soon, Paul says to Timothy. For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. And so here's our second runner. He didn't finish the race. He quit the race. So get the picture, the Apostle Paul and Demas, they're running this race, the race set before them. They're running this race, and and some moment along this race, Demas quits. He quits, he throws in the towel, he finishes, he's done. And Paul keeps on running. And we read that Demas loved this world He loved this world so much. He had so much passion for this present world that he threw in the towel. He quit. And so as we begin this morning, I want us to have in mind this picture of two racers, two runners, one of them able to declare, I have finished the race, but the other one who says, I quit, I'm out. But our hope for us is is that we will finish the race. We've been talking about the last four weeks how God has given us endurance to keep on running, how he's given us his discipline so that we would come up underneath his discipline and grow and develop and become more like Jesus. He's given this peace and holiness to walk in. And last week, Pastor Sherm helped us understand that he's he's given us a, a new kingdom And so all of this, we we want it to be to encourage us to finish the race. But here we see in the story, there are those who finish and those who quit. And so I want you to have in mind that story, those two runners, as we now turn to Hebrews chapter 12. If you don't have your Bible, again, the, the one that is underneath your seat, you can turn to page 1206, and this is where we will be this morning. And I'm going to start at verse 25. We ended last week at verse 24, so I'm just going to pick up in verse 25. The author of Hebrews continues and he says, See to it 
that you do not refuse him who is speaking. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Now, I've been reading this passage for several weeks, and I would read this to get to the next verse. How many of you do that? You, you, you're reading the verse, but you're reading it so quickly just to get to the next verse, and then you're reading that verse to get to the next verse, and th- this is what I was doing until I realized what I was reading. Just a few days ago, it, it just dawned on me. God has spoken to us. I mean, he has spoken to us. God, the, the creator, he has spoken to us. Do not refuse him who is speaking. And so here's what I want to do. I want to take us on a, a detour, if you'll allow me. And I know for you, many of you hear detour, you see detour, and you, all of a sudden you start to get anxious. But a detour is sometimes meant to protect us or to protect others. Or a detour is, is meant to provide a better, ultimately provide a better route. So a detour, if you will, it's for our good. And I want to I do kind of a, a scripture detour. Because I don't want us to miss this, that God is speaking to us. That he has spoken to us. And so for the sake of time, though, I'm going to put some verses on the screen to help us. But it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25, do not refuse him who is speaking. And so who is him? It's God. And we see this in Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, the very first word of this letter is God. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets and many portions and in many ways, notice verse 2, in these last days, He has spoken to us in his son. So God has spoken to us. God speaks to us. Now sometimes I think we become so familiar that we kind of forget this. So yesterday in my home, I got up from studying and just real quickly I perused my house And I found that in my house, I have that I found 13 Bibles. 13 Bibles. Not not kids' Bibles. I mean, Bibles. I had 13 Bibles. And I think what happens in our culture today is that with the excessive availability to the Word of God, we sometimes have apathy for the Word of God. Because it's so readily accessible to us. It's on our phones. We have hundreds of copies underneath the seats you're sitting on. And so this availability, this excessive availability to the word of God produces sometimes in us apathy for the word of God. And you know, when I get apathetic or lazy, sometimes I need someone to come alongside me and kind of encourage me and kind of push me a little bit. And so this morning, I want King David to kind of push us a little bit to remind us that God is speaking to us. And so I want him to teach us for just a moment. And then I thought of Psalm 119. In Psalm 119, David, he he has, there's over 170 verses in this one psalm. And only two of them don't reference God's word. And so to spur us on, to to give us a passion for God's word, to open our eyes to to realize that God has spoken to us, I want to share with you what David says about the word of God. And so I'm just going to run through some of these. In Psalm 119, David says, I have treasured your word in my heart. Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. I cling to to your testimonies. Your statues are my songs. I delight in your law. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. My eyes fail longing for your word. 
Oh, how sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. They are the joy. Your words are the joy of my heart. I wait for your word. This one is mind-boggling to me. I opened my mouth wide and panted, for I longed for your commandments. My eyes anticipate the night watches that I may meditate on your word. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great spoil. I love your law. Seven times a day I praise you because of your righteous ordinances. Let my tongue sing of your word. Now, we use these kinds of words and this kind of language to talk about tacos and to talk about sports. But here is David realizing that God has spoken to him and he is in awe. I mean, he says, when I lay, I can't wait to lay down at night and to put my head on my pillow so I can just meditate and think about your word to me. Who says that? I mean, we lay our heads down at night and we have our iPads or our iPhones. And here's David saying, I, 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 I just want to wait for your word. I love your word. And so in Hebrews chapter 12, he says, don't refuse him who's speaking to you. And so for some of us, the, the point this morning is I need to get in God's word. I need to have an appetite and a longing for the word of God like David. And so God is speaking to us. What is he speaking? Well, Hebrews chapter 1 tells us in verse 2, in these last days, he's spoken to us in his son. He's spoken to us in his son, Jesus, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And so, yes, God is speaking to you. He's speaking to me. And what is he speaking? What is he saying? Jesus. And he's saying Jesus is better. If you look at verse 4, and I'm going to run through several verses here in Hebrews, just so you can see that, that what God is speaking to us is that Jesus is better. Verse 4, having become as much better than the angels, talking about Jesus, and he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 3. For he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22. So much the more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. But now Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted on better promises. Jesus, God is saying to us, is better. And then last week, Pastor Sherm, in Hebrews chapter 12, he finished with verse 24. And to Jesus... And to Jesus, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. And so last week we learned that, that Abel's blood speaks of vengeance, but the blood of Christ that was shed for you and me speaks and cries out mercy, grace, and forgiveness. And so Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Then let's look at verse 25. Keep going. So see to it that you do not refuse him. So you feel that? Don't, don't refuse him. Don't refuse God who has spoken to us in Jesus, whose life and death and burial and resurrection allows the forgiveness of our sins and the adoption for you and I to become sons and daughters of God. Don't refuse him. Don't refuse him. And then the author of Hebrews is going to give a history lesson. And parents and grandparents do this. When, when you're wanting your child or your grandchild to get something, you'll often share something from your past to help them 
understand what's happening. And this is exactly what the author of Hebrews does. He goes on in verse 25. Hang with me. For if those who did not escape when they refused him, who had warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. So here's what's happening. He's giving the readers a history lesson. And he's saying, listen, in the Old Testament, God's people, he tells us they were warned. We read in Deuteronomy that God warned his people. They were warned, but they refused. And this word refused, refused is, is means to reject. It means to kind of take a calculated assessment and reject. It means to go your own way. This, this isn't like forgetting. I mean, this is like I'm thinking about what I'm doing and I'm kind of counting the cost and I'm refusing, I'm rejecting him. And so because they were warned by God and because they refused God, it says they did not escape and they ended up dying in the wilderness instead of entering into God's rest. And this is the truth. For those who refuse God, there is no escape. And unfortunately, this is the posture many people walk around day by day is they refuse God. They refuse God and there is no escape. There is no escape. How, how do we refuse God? How, how do you, well, the, the same way as the Old Testament, the story in the Old Testament is, is that we, we hear God, we hear him, we hear his instruction, we hear his warning that he gives us, and we refuse. He, he calls us to walk in obedience, and we say no. And so, but, but what do we do when we find ourselves hearing God but refusing him, what do we do? Well, this became clear to me yesterday. Now, I'm a really good dad because what I do is when I want to go jog and my wife's gone, is I turn the TV on and I put my kids in front of the TV. And so, um, so I'm a really good dad. And so I do that, and, they, they, and I run around the block. So I'm not like, you know, running to... Fort Worth or anything. I, I just run in my neighborhood and, and I know they're going to sit and watch. And so yesterday I, I said to my boys, I said, okay, I'm going to go for a jog around the neighborhood. And they know how this works. I said, you guys can watch two short cartoons. And so I went out the back door and I went on my little jog and then I came back to the back door and the TV's still on. And I know it's been longer than two cartoons and so I kind of just knock on the back window and all of a sudden one of my sons turned and his eyes are really big and he knows I'm busted and so I just slowly opened the door and it was well uh, dad dad this is the this is the the third cartoon but it's part two of the second one we watched so we're just gonna go ahead and watch it and I said good try I said but how many did I tell you could watch two how many are you watching three so I warned my sons before I left, and they refused. I had a moment there with them. They go to the playroom. A couple minutes later, I go to the playroom. And as genuine as my son could possibly be, he said, Daddy, I'm sorry I didn't listen and obey. When we refuse our Heavenly Father, there is grace for his children to say, Daddy, I didn't listen, obey. I'm sorry. And so maybe you, even this moment, this morning, this day, you find yourself refusing God. Well, there's grace for you. There's grace for you. But I do want us to heed the warning that for those who refuse, God, there is no escape. And so let us listen 
obediently to what he's calling us to do. Whatever it may be, let us be obedient. But God not only speaks, verse 26, it says, and his voice shook the earth. His voice shook the earth. This is referring, and Pastor Sherm talked about this last week. This refers to an incident that happened with God's people and that God shook and he spoke to them back then. And then, but now he has promised. So he shook the earth back then, but now he has promised. So this is not a suggestion. This is not something God may do. He has promised. And what is this promise? Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but, but also the heaven. And then the author of Hebrews in verse 27 is going to explain this a little bit for us. He says, this expression yet once more denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. And so friends, there is coming a shaking like no other there is coming a time where, where God is going to shake and it's going to be so violent that all created things will not last. And I think a truth for us this morning is that there is no security in created things. That truck that you so desire and love, there's going to come a day that it's not going to work and start. That, that bank account that you have money in, there's coming a day that it's going to be empty. There is coming in a, all the materialistic things that we have and trinkets and toys, they will be no more because there is ultimately coming a shaking that says all created things will not last. And so just as the one who refuses God, there is no escape, there is no security for the one who puts his trust in created things and stuff. And so what are you holding so tightly to? What is, what is your created thing that you're trusting in, that you have hope in? You know, and sometimes we think if we, if we can just have more money, then we'll be good. If we just have more money, then, then, then everything's going to be okay. And I saw this week, there was an interview with Dwayne Wade, one of the NBA greats. He's retiring this year. And he was in an interview with a reporter and he was sharing about life after the NBA. And here's a man who has, in 2018 alone, made over $30 million in one year. That's a lot of money. But in this interview, he's talking about that when he retires, that he's going to seek counseling so that he can adjust to his new lifestyle. And I thought, you know, that's interesting. That's a word for us. Here's a guy that has all the money he needs, but he realizes that after he retires, that that money is not going to be enough. And so for many of us, we think if we could just have more money, then we'll be okay. But in the end, it's all just stuff, and it's going to be shaken till it's no more. So build wisely. Invest in your faith. Invest in the, the, the faith of your children and your spouse and your grandchildren and your neighbors and your coworkers. Build wisely. Invest in things that last because there is no security, we read, in created things. But there are things that will remain. Let's look at verse 28. Therefore, therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, and so you and I receive this kingdom we read about last week, a kingdom where God reigns and Jesus is at his side and it's a flourishing, safe place for God's people. And we're receiving this kingdom, but not fully. But we have received this kingdom that cannot be shaken. And here's what I want you to notice. It says that you and I receive, not achieve. Many of us are trying to achieve the favor and love of God, but we cannot. We can't work hard enough. We can't pray hard enough. We can't go to church enough. We cannot achieve. We receive. 
And so many of you, you've been on this spiritual treadmill trying to run and gain God's favor and love because you're trusting in your ability to try to be able to achieve and then receive the grace of Jesus Christ. And so my plea to you this morning is that there is coming an end to your race. And have you trusted in Christ alone? Or are you trusting in yourself? Because it says we receive from God. We don't achieve, we receive. In verse 28, since we receive this kingdom, a kingdom that is unshakable, let us show gratitude. Let us give thanksgiving. So to finish well, to keep running, let us give thanks. Let us be the most thankful and grateful people on this planet because we have received an unshakable kingdom. by which may we offer to God an acceptable service. Let us worship him. So in addition to being grateful and thankful, let us serve him. Let us worship him with reverence and awe. That's how you finish well. That's how you keep running the races. You, you're grateful, you're thankful, and you're worshiping and you're serving no matter where you are, in the workplace or in this building, we serve, we, we worship with reverence and awe. And then the closing is a warning, and it's heavy. Verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. So think about how we began. Do not refuse the one who's speaking, because he is a consuming fire. He's a consuming fire. And here's what that means for us this morning. He's either your powerful friend or your dangerous enemy. See, in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 3, we see that for the people of God, God was a powerful friend. But for those who refused God, he was a dangerous enemy. Deuteronomy 9, 3, Now, therefore, today... That it is the Lord your God who is crossing over before you as a consuming fire. Notice what he's going to do. He will destroy them and he will subdue them before you. So people of God, God is going to go before you as a consuming fire. And he's going to destroy your enemies so that you may drive them out and destroy them quickly. Just as the Lord has spoken to you. So he's a consuming fire. He's either a powerful friend or a dangerous enemy. And our hope for you, like the Apostle Paul, as you have trusted in Christ and you're aiming to finish the race. But if you fall into the camp of men and women like Demas, who've quit because they love this world so much, would you please heed this warning that our God is a consuming fire?